Hello, Tess. Test one, two. There you go. I like this microphone better anyway. Okay. Are we good? Thank you very much, Steve. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. It's really nice to be here. I'm so glad we're back in person. <laughs> Hey, I, you know, I, I tell people and my students, I really think uh, the Zoom, the way we've seen Zoom advance over the past years has really been fantastic in a number of ways because it has allowed us to continue collaborations across the nation and across the world in ways we just could not fathom before. And it's been great for my students because I'm at the University of Scranton where we don't really have a space physics research group or a radio science research group, but we're able to use this to just routinely interact with so many different people many of the people in this room, uh, many researchers at other universities. So it, it's just been really wonderful. So I am Nathaniel Frizzell. Uh, my call sign is uh, W2NAF, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Scranton. And one of the things that's really important to me is that I became a professor of physics and electrical engineering because of ham radio. So I started out, I got my interest when I was in seventh or eighth grade, and it was through scouting. I went on a scouting trip, and that's when I learned about ham radio. And it just stuck with me for so long that I eventually taught ham radio at scout camp and at National Scout Jamborees, and it made me go from being a, a music education major to adding a physics major. I just eventually got my PhD studying ionospheric physics. So I'm really an amateur radio operator first, and then I, I happen to do this for my job now. So it's been really wonderful. So I'm going to talk about HAMSI, the personal space weather station, and the 2023 and 2024 solar eclipses. So uh, what is HAMSI? HAMSI is a ham radio science citizen investigation. And this is something I came up with um, I, along with a few other people while I was in graduate school at Virginia Tech. And this is a group or organization that really aims to connect the amateur radio community with the professional space science community for mutual benefit. Because I found out that there were many people in both communities, the hams are use radio propagation all the time, they're affected by space weather, um, and they, they often study the physics behind it, but they don't necessarily have all of the tools or the background that the professionals have. And conversely, the professionals don't always, they have lots of theory and they have instruments, but they don't see things the same way amateurs do. And I, one thing that was very telling to me is I spoke to someone who has a PhD in, you know, ionospheric physics and, and HF communications. And one time they were actually surprised that you could communicate around the world with less than 100 watts. And, and so it's just, it's really interesting to see where the crossover is. So HAMSI has uh, three major objectives. One is to advance scientific research and understanding through amateur radio activities. Two, we want to encourage the development of new technologies to support this research. And this is why we team up with Tapper to really handle that engineering part of things. And then three is to provide educational opportunities for the amateur radio community and the general public. And so as I give this presentation, you'll hear more about some of the activities we're doing in HAMSI. And at the end, you will find out how you can can join us. And I really like to think of HAMSI and Tapper as really being a team. I'm a member of Tapper also. Um, and I, I think it's great that we can really blend both the, the engineering focus that Tapper generally has with the science focus that HAMSI generally has and have them hopefully help each other. So just a reminder of some of the basics of uh, ionospheric physics and radio propagation. Uh, we have uh, the ionosphere. This is very important to amateur radio operators. This is a layer of the upper atmosphere that is uh, ionized uh, or made electrically charged by solar ultraviolet and x-ray energy hitting the upper atmosphere. So during the day you get the most structure in the ionosphere. You, it gets divided into about four layers, the D, E, 
F1 and F2 layers. And then at night, when the sun goes away, those solar inputs go away, the ionosphere starts to recombine and the electron density goes down, but it doesn't go away completely. You, it just, uh, you get the E layer and the F layer. And of course, this is just very cartoonish, very simplified, but it's a good mental picture to have. So why is this so important to amateur radio operators, uh, especially if you work on the, the lower bands, the HF bands, and now you're getting into the, the low frequencies as well, medium frequencies, uh, you get ionospheric refraction, and you can get these signals to uh, travel around the world because of this. So this is what we call a ray trace diagram, where you're showing uh, how you're numerically calculating how a radio signal here at 14.25 megahertz would uh, propagate from, say, California over here to where I live in Springbrook, Pennsylvania over here. And you can see that as the radio signals go up, they get refracted by the uh, electron density, which is representing color, can come back down to Earth, and it can skip and it can go over the horizon and allow communications. So this little movie I made up uh, using this ray trace and an ionospheric model. So you can see during the day, you get more refraction, the electron densities are higher. At night, the electron densities reduce, you get less refraction, less hops. And uh, now the computer's predicting there's no communications between the two stations, so the band is shutting down. Again, with these models, it's a really nice picture to have in your head. You do also want to remember that it is an idealized situation. Here at night, all the rays are escaping into space. I'll try and fast, see if I can fast forward. And then as the day comes back, as the day comes back, once dawn appears again, um, the, here comes dawn, the ionosphere builds up again and the signals will get refracted back to Earth. Here comes dawn. So in this particular case, what we're doing is we're changing the background electron densities with time, but we're keeping the frequency uh, stable. We're keeping that constant at 14.25 megahertz. So HF refraction is a function of electron density. And it's also a function of frequency. So here are some more ray traces where we're showing something similar, but now we're keeping the background electron densities the same. And we're using something, we're changing the frequency instead. So you can see as you go higher in frequency, you get less refraction. As you go lower in frequency, you get more refraction. On the top, we have 15 megahertz. On the bottom, we have 10 megahertz. The 15 megahertz uh, rays take about one hop to travel 1,500 kilometers, and the 10 megahertz rays take about two hops to travel the same distance. So one of the reasons this is really important from a science perspective is because as the radio signals are going through here, the ionosphere, as it's changing, it modulates the signals. It modulates not only whether or not we can see them, but it also modulates the information on those signals as well. And so we can use receivers out here to help us study what's going on in the ionosphere by looking at how those how that received signal is changed compared to the original one. So we can use these communications as a method of remote sensing. So already the amateur radio community has created a number of wonderful tools for doing data collection and doing this sort of remote sensing. And you're probably familiar with many of them already. How many people here are familiar with the reverse beacon network? Almost everyone in the room. How many people are familiar with WhisperNet? And, and PSK reporter. So all three of these systems represent different uh, automated uh, distributed receiver systems that are observing amateur radio communications in real time around the world. And they're sending those observations back to central servers. And you can either go to these websites and you can download the data yourself, or um, in some cases you contact the operator of the website and they're happy to give you those observations. So this data now goes back to 2008, and I was convinced that we could see uh, space weather types of effects in there. And so one of the types of effects that I first looked at was how, what happens when the solar flare um, hits, uh, hits the Earth. 
And in these, what you expect to happen is the solar flare will cause a radio blackout because uh, you'll get this sudden enhancement of the D region ionosphere and it will absorb the signals. So this is looking at both the RBN and WhisperNet uh, back from September of 2017. And this is right before an X-class flare, and this is right after. And you can see there is an 82% drop in the observed communications over that time. So it's really quite dramatic. And you can look at it this way too. So this is the time series. Here's Solar Flare 1. Here's Solar Flare 2. They're both X-class flares. This is looking over Europe where it was noon. And you can just see this total drop in communications on 7 megahertz during both. And then here, um, this is contrasting with the United States, which was in the dawn sector. That was actually shielded from the solar flare. You, you, just see a, you don't see any drop during the first flare where it's really in night. And when it's dawn, you just see a, a slight drop. So I've done a number of studies with uh, these, with the reverse beacon network, PSK reporter, WhisperNet systems, uh, including the solar flares, looking at geomagnetic storms, and also something called traveling ionospheric disturbances, which you're going to hear more about later from, say, Diego. Um, so these are really wonderful systems, and it's a lot of fun to work with that. But one of the things we found is these systems really are not designed to make precision scientific measurements. You know, we don't know uh, these systems. You don't know exactly uh, what the tolerance of the uh, whether the receivers are calibrated for the frequencies. You're probably getting at best, you know, uh, plus or minus uh, one hertz on the uh, uh, frequency measurements, and it could be much worse than that. It could be, you know, just are you in the correct band? So one of the things we started doing a few years ago is we said, all right, can we design a system that will be able to make much more precision measurements for the purpose of studying the ionosphere and still design a system that would be of use to amateur radio operators and of interest to that? And so that's how we came up with the Personal Space Weather Station project, which we've now been collaborating with uh, Tapper and Case Western Reserve University University and a number of other universities over the past few years. So the idea is we want to create a modular system that could be deployed in anyone's backyard here that could make measurements useful to both amateur radio and to space physics and space weather. And so this is a basic block diagram of the system. At its heart, we would have a software-defined radio, which is the goal of the Tangerine SDR project. And this would uh, be operational from about 100 kilohertz to about 60 megahertz, and it would uh, be it would provide wideband raw IQ output that could we could then use to derive many different data products. This would be uh, stabilized with a GPS disciplined oscillator. Uh, that would provide precision frequency measurements and time stamping. It would also be capable of receiving from multiple antennas uh, and have everything phase locked. So that's one part of the system. Uh, we also have the ability to attach a ground magnetometer because what that does is it can measure currents that are moving overhead in the ionosphere and understanding those current systems and the changes there, that can have implications for HF uh, propagation. For instance, you hear about the KP index, um, uh, the KP, yeah, the KP index and how that affects propagation. That's all measured with ground magnetometers. We also now have a VLF receiver, very low frequency receiver, which you'll hear about more later. So this particular project is divided into a number of different teams. The University of Scranton is the lead team uh, working on it, trying to integrate everything together. Uh, Tapper is responsible for designing the Tangerine SDR software-defined radio and the ground magnetometer. Uh, Case Western Reserve, which they're over there, they are working on the low-cost version of the system, which instead of having a software-defined radio, it really is focused just on making precision measurements of a beacon like WWV. Uh, NJIT does the magnetometer science, and uh, the University of Alabama is doing all the software for the website and the database, so we'll hear from them later as well. And we have funding from the National Science Foundation and ARDC, so thank you very much to both of those uh, groups. Um, this shows a little bit more about the two different systems. We have the low-cost system, which is 
uh, targeted to be about $300, and that's measuring just Doppler shift of the HF systems. So the idea here is you have WWV, which is transmitting a very precise uh, carrier frequency, and then as the ionosphere moves up and down or changes its parameters, that will impart a slight change in frequency, a Doppler shift that's received by the uh, grape receiver. And so that's what you see over here. I'll go over that more later. And then this is an example of the types of measurements we'll be able to make when we get the tangerine SDR going. Uh, this is an example of a chirp ionogram that was uh, received using an Edis N200, but eventually we hope to do that with the Tangerine SDR. And uh, Nisha will be talking about that later today. Um, the ground magnetometer looks like uh, this, uh, originally designed by uh, Dave Witten and then uh, Scotty and then Jules uh, Maddie. And uh, this is uh, going to be available for sale very soon in the Tapper store. So the units have been built and produced, and they are currently. Uh, in testing. So that's coming along. And then we have the new addition to the project, the Whistler Catcher VLF module, which you will hear from Jonathan Rizzo, KC3EEY later, uh, about how that um, is going to be part of the project as well. So one of the goals for these two systems, both the RBN WhisperNet PSK reporter system and the personal space weather station, we want to apply these to the upcoming solar eclipses in 2023 and 2024. So on October 14th, 2023, there's going to be an annular solar eclipse that traverses from the northwest to the southeast, going this way across the United States. And then on, on April 8th, 2024, there will be a total solar eclipse going from the southwest up to the northeast. And these eclipses have profound effects on the ionosphere, and in many ways they represent one of the few controlled uh, experiments that we can actually run in ionospheric physics. So a little review of how this works. Uh, a solar eclipse is when the sun, the moon, and the earth all line up, and the shadow of the moon is cast on the earth. Now this shadow has two parts. It has what's called the umbra, and this is the innermost region of the shadow, and it has the penumbra, which is the outermost region of the shadow. So this is what defines the difference between total eclipse and a partial eclipse. You, have, you experience total eclipse when you're located right within the umbra, and you experience partial eclipse when you're in the penumbra. And the total solar eclipse, especially from a visual standpoint, is much more dramatic than a partial solar eclipse. During the total solar eclipse, you can even see the sun's corona. If you, happen, if you have a chance to be in the path of totality during a solar eclipse, you should take this opportunity. There's also what we call total and annular solar eclipses. So the moon, uh, when it's at perigee, it's closer to the Earth. And when it's at apogee, it's farther away from the Earth, a little closer to the Sun. And so by coincidence, when the Moon is near perigee, it is sized large enough to completely cover the solar disk during an eclipse. And this is what happens when you have a total solar eclipse. At apogee, the Moon is farthest from the Earth, and it will fit inside of the solar disk rather than ob obscure it. And this creates an annular solar eclipse. So here are some pictures to show you the difference between the three. So total, the moon is completely covering the solar disk, and you're able to see just the uh, corona of the sun. The partial, you just have a partial covering of the solar disk. In the annular, the moon covers just the center of the sun, and you can still see a little bit of the solar disk all around it. So why do we care from an amateur radio perspective? And this is because solar radiation is blocked from the atmosphere during an eclipse. We can expect the ionosphere to respond similarly to day and night. But, you know, it's not exactly the same as day and night. There are some differences. So what are those differences? The eclipse is shorter in duration. It's more localized. It travels at supersonic speeds. And it travels in directions that are different from the westward motion of the dawn and dusk terminators. So 
as a controlled experiment, aside from dawn, dusk, and the seasons, there are very, very few cases where we can know a priori how much solar energy will be input into the upper atmosphere. Solar flares, geomagnetic storms, and other random events, we can't predict them. However, we can calculate eclipses with great accuracy ahead of time, and so they can be considered a controlled ionospheric experiment. So that's why this is so valuable to us. So I, I ran a few calculations. I made these movies to show you what the path of the different eclipses look like. And these movies are a little bit different from the ones that you see normally because these are actually calculated at 300 kilometers altitude uh, right in the F region of the ionosphere. So here's the annular eclipse of October 14th, 2023. And then here is the total solar eclipse of April 8th, 2024. And if you want to calculate those yourself, I have the code to do that up on GitHub so you can actually run those yourself. Yes. This is all done in Python. Okay. It's all done in Python and we're using, I'm using CardoPy and um, I think AstroPy to actually do the calculations, CardoPy and Matplotlib to do the visualizations. And then I use Python to glue it all together. So if you go to github.com uh, slash hamsi, you can find the repository that will do this. It's called Eclipse Calculator. And then you can calculate it at any altitude you want. So you can put in an arbitrary altitude and you can see what the E region is doing. You can see what the F region is doing. So it's a really nice tool for that. So what we want to do is we want to have some experiments, um, radio propagation and ionospheric experiments to study these two events in the next few years. Uh, so I'm sure most of you remember back in 2017, there was a total solar eclipse and we did some experiments then, right? How many people either went to see the solar eclipse or were part of the solar eclipse QSO party? Quite a few. Great. So I'm going to review some of the results we got from the 2017 eclipse. Now this one started in, again in the northwest, traversed uh, now down to the southeast in just about four hours. And so we had some research questions. We went to news, no, can we use high frequency ham radio communications to observe eclipse effects on the ionosphere? Can we use data model comparisons to better understand the ham radio data and constrain or calibrate the model? And so we created a solar eclipse QSO party. So the goal for this was to really create a ham radio fun event that you could also see the eclipse effects in. So we really created a, a contest-like event that ran for eight hours on August 21st, 2017. You got two points for CW or digital, one point for phone, and the multiplier was by grids. And the idea is that we wanted to incentivize CW and digital because that would uh, give us the most data back from the automated systems. And we wanted the multiplication by grid squares so that we would cover the most of the ionosphere. And so it was quite successful. Um, I received, uh, I was able to parse 570 logs that were submitted to me that resulted in almost 30,000 QSOs with almost 5,000 unique call signs in them and 80 DX entities. And from the automated systems, if you add all this up, we had over 2.5 million spots for the solar eclipse QSO party. So it was really great. Uh, so we wrote that up. I wrote that up um, for geophysical research letters. And this shows a map of all the reverse beacon network spots. All the little black dots are the uh, CW transmitters. All the blue stars are the reverse beacon network uh, CW automated receivers. And every colored dot is the midpoint between a transmitter and a receiver uh, for a particular spot reported by the RBN. And the reason we choose the midpoint is because we're making the assumption that that's where the ionosphere is actually affecting the signal. Now to best see the eclipse effects, I kept only the data where there was uh, at least 90% obscuration at 300 kilometers. And this is what actual 
uh, results looked like, observations. So this is reverse beacon network data on 14 megahertz. Uh, on the y-axis, we have distance between transmitter and receiver from 0 to 3,000 kilometers. On the x-axis, we have time relative to the maximum um, eclipse. And so right, at, in the, right in the middle is 0. And then you have an hour and a half before and an hour and a half afterward. And the white dashed line here is showing uh, how much eclipse was occurring. When it's all the way low, that was the least amount of light or the most shadow. So that's maximum eclipse there. And then no eclipse is at the ends. And so you can see that uh, 14 megahertz is going like gangbusters uh, an hour and a half to an hour before the eclipse. And then the communication started to shut down as the band shut down. Communications reduced until you got to the eclipse maximum. And then as the eclipse went away, the band started to come back. And that worked out very nicely. We actually looked at all, we looked at four different amateur radio bands. These are all observations. So here's the 14 megahertz plot I just showed you. Here's 7 megahertz, 3.5 megahertz, and 1.8 megahertz on the same. Uh, X and Y scale, so it's the same format as before. Uh, the 7 megahertz, instead of shutting down, it went long, so the communications went from about 1,000 to uh, 1,500 kilometers in communications distance, and then the 1.8 and 3.5 and megahertz, they opened up. So to help us understand this a little bit more, we use this tool called ray tracing, where, which I showed you before, but instead of using just a statistical uh, ionospheric model, we used a first principles physics-based model of the ionosphere that had the eclipse put into it. And that was provided to us by our collaborators at the Naval Research Laboratory. And so we were able to simulate what it would look like from a transmitter to a particular receive point uh, for every station in the uh, Eclipse QSO party. So we, we ran the model. We created a theoretical grid of transmitters. We uh, took um, all the regular receiver locations known from the RBN, and we ray traced between every single one of those at a three-minute cadence for all four of those frequencies for the period of the solar eclipse QSO party. And then we were able to put those uh, model results in the same format as the actual observations. And so here's the 14 megahertz uh, comparison. And you can see it lines up quite well. The actual observations, they're much more spread. The, um, the model uh, is much tighter. Uh, and But you still see the drop off. We, we see some asymmetries there where you have more communications at the beginning and then a more gradual recovery. So this was a good way to compare the observations to the physics-based model. One of the most interesting things to come out of this is that we were actually able to separate out which ionospheric layer most of the communications were propagating off of. So I separated out so that um, in the model, if you look at just E region refractions, that actually matches up best with 14 megahertz. So during the 2017 solar eclipse QSO party, if you were communicating on 14 megahertz, you're most likely refracting off of the E layer with very low takeoff angles. The high takeoff angles escape the ionosphere. You can see the lower bands don't agree well with the model here. But in, if we look at the model for greater than 125 kilometer altitude refractions or the F region, you get much better agreement. So this suggests that the low bands were actually refracting off of the F region. And if you looked in the model, it was refracting off of high angle rays, high takeoff elevation angles. And so the conclusions, um, this is very interesting that we're actually able to use the model to identify which takeoff angles were most likely during the eclipse and also which ionospheric layer was most likely during the eclipse for all these bands. So we want to run the solar eclipse QSO party today, again, um, for 2023-2024. So think about what would you change? What would you keep the same? And if you have um, ideas, you know, come talk to me during break or send me an email or join one of our telecons and you can let us know.
uh, some of the science questions I've been thinking of for the upcoming solar eclipse QSO party. Can the annular eclipse be observed in HF communications? How large is the disturbance? How long before and after maximum eclipse are the effects observed? Is the onset and recovery asymmetry uh, observed in the upcoming eclipses? Will we see the same results suggesting E-layer propagation for 14 megahertz and F-layer for 1.8 to 7 megahertz? And very probably not because, you know, we're going into solar cycle 25. The background ionospheric conditions are going to be different. How similar are the eclipse effects to the dawn and dusk or gray line propagation? So we talked a little bit about Doppler shift already. Uh, and we had some amateurs make... Uh, Doppler shift observations of WWV during the last eclipse. This was before the GRAPE project, uh, but Steve Ryer, uh, WA9VNJ, who unfortunately is now a silent key, he sent us some very nice observations. And he did this using a Yezu FT-857 that was locked to a Trimble Thunderbolt GPS DO. And so he was located near Milwaukee over here and listened to WWV on 10 megahertz. And these are his results. The top results here show August 20th, the day before the eclipse. That's the control day. The bottom results show the actual eclipse day. And I want you to notice a few things. First, you can see on both days in the morning, you have positive Doppler shifts. And in the evening, you have negative Doppler shifts. This red line here is showing... Uh, the solar elevation angle. So when it's highest in the sky, that's noon. So as the reason you see this pattern is at dawn, the ionosphere is building up, the propagation paths get shorter, that gives you the positive Doppler shift. In the evening, the ionosphere is uh, becoming less dense, you get the negative Doppler shifts as the propagation paths get uh, longer. You can see the eclipse here in the eclipse day where you see the negative doppler shifts at the beginning of the eclipse like the evening you see the positive doppler shifts at the end of the eclipse like dawn uh so we see the eclipse effects very clearly the other very interesting thing to see is you see this spike here you even see a little spike there those are actually uh signatures of solar flares so you get that sudden ionization from a solar flare you can see that in a very slight you know 0 0.1, 0 0.2 hertz Doppler shift of WWV. And this this one here, this is just a C-class flare. So this technique is very sensitive to these types of, um, you know, these types of phenomena. So what we want to do now, we the GRAPE project has been moving along very well, and we've, we've had quite a bit of success with that. So we'd like to use these GRAPEs to study the uh, eclipses, the next two eclipses, and also just everyday ionospheric variability. And we want to do it a little bit differently than before, because if you look at this plot over here, you can see we just have one Doppler shift measurement per unit time. But really, we see a lot of variability here, and you ask, well, where does that variability come from? Is that instrumental? Is it uh, geophysical? And it turns out that you really can't make good measurements, good Doppler shift measurements, just monitoring a single frequency as a function of time. You really need to look at the spectrum. And uh, Steve Serwin, WA5FRF, is really the person who brought this to my attention. And so we now have, with the new uh, GRAPE um, system uh, that Bill Engelke has been working on, we can now save full Doppler shift, I'm sorry, full spectrum measurements of this. And you can really uh, start to understand what's going on underneath the hood. And so now we can see things where there's F layer reflection, where there's the E, re e layer reflection. These are measurements from Steve Serwin at dawn and at dusk. And here you can see uh, mode splitting where you get multipath at dawn and at, at dusk that you could only observe when you're using this uh, these sorts of um, full spectrum observations. So uh, I'm very excited that we're going to be able to do this during the next two eclipses. Um, Christina, are you showing this plot in your talk? Okay. Uh, I won't say, I'll let Christina talk more about this, but let me just tell you, this is a very exciting plot showing two years worth of grape observations taken by 
uh, John Gibbons. And I'll let Christina go over the value of this plot. It's fantastic. Um, so we put together, uh, working with Case Western, we put together another National Science Foundation proposal to study the eclipses over the next two years using these grapes. And we came up with this map where we have um, the WWV and CHU. So the new version of the grape will be able to monitor three frequencies at a time. We have uh, we laid out a grid of where we think we can put these stations to uh, basically cover the entire United States. And so that's the little black specks here. And then the red and the yellow points are the midpoints between those specks between the uh, receive sites and WWV and CHU. So we're trying to cover both of the eclipses. And um, we want to at least, we want to at least fill out these locations. Uh, but ultimately we would, we hope to grow the network to be even more than just these stations, because I think there's a lot of neat things that we're working on doing if you have data from over the entire, um, United States as many stations as possible. Some these are the science questions from that proposal. How do dawn and dusk ionospheric variability, as observed by high frequency Doppler shift measurements, vary with local time, season, latitude, longitude, frequency, distance, and direction from the transmitter? Is the eclipse ionospheric response symmetric with regard to onset and recovery timing? So it's you know reminiscent of what we said for the uh, solar eclipse QSO party. How is a similar? How similar is the eclipse to daily dawn and dusk terminator passage? Do we observe multipath HF mode splitting uh, in the post-eclipse interval similar to that um, that we saw in Steve Serwin's measurements for dawn events? How is the response different for the southward annular eclipse in 2023 compared to the northward total solar eclipse in 2024? And so I'm happy to tell you that that proposal was funded so we are actually going to do this and so um we in this funding it includes uh the equipment for the 30 uh stations that i showed you that we would be fielding so we'll be looking for volunteers for those we're also hoping to uh probably work with tapper to make that um those receivers also available to other people who want them and who could uh, pay for them on their own and um, we're also going to be funding uh, some students to work on this. So uh, we have a new PhD student from Case Western, uh, Rachel, AD8XY. AC8, AC8XY. So uh, Rachel Bodeker is going to be the PhD student working on this for the next few years. We'll have a computer science master's student from Scranton working on this. And we hope that you'll be involved as well. So if you'd like to get involved with what HAMSI is doing, the first thing to do is just go to hamsci.org. We now have over 600 members. You can click the nice blue button right in the middle of the website, and you can join our Google group uh, right there. And that's how you get all the major announcements about things that we're doing. Um, for more direct and personal participation, uh, we encourage you to join in our open Zoom telecons. So we currently have three regular Zoom telecons every week. We have the uh, Tangerine SDR telecon, which is co-hosted with Tapper. That's on Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. We have the Grape telecon, uh, which is a, a telecon you want to join if you're interested in the Grape and how we're using that for studying the eclipses. That's on Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern. And then the if you want to help plan and participate in the solar, QS, solar eclipse QSO party or SCQPs, that is on Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern. All of these links are available at hamsci.org. Just click get involved and you can get the Zoom links right there. Also, we have a in-person and hybrid conference, which we will hopefully have in Scranton this year, uh, right at the end of University of Scranton spring break, March 17th and 18th. And so uh, as soon as this conference is done here, I will be going back to Scranton and trying to get all the details worked out and get the official announcement out on hamside.org through the ARRL, and we'll get that information out through Tapper as well. So 
Put that on your calendar. Uh, hopefully come to Scranton, Pennsylvania. We're working on putting in a brand new uh, ham radio station, which I'll talk about on Sunday morning, funded by ARDC. We also have the uh, Steamtown uh, National Historic Site there, too, if you're into steam rail cars. So um, it's so nice to be here at Tapper. You know, when we're at Hamvention, uh, we were right with the Tapper booth over there, and we got this great photo. So it's... um really wonderful to work with all of you and uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, Jay. Yes, multiple. <laughs> we have quite a few. They have all, yes, they've passed peer review. Our most recent was published in Geophysical Research Letters um, this past February, I think, and that was on the uh, traveling ionospheric disturbances seen in the uh, reverse speaking network. And uh, Christina, where's Christina? She is very busily shepherding at least two more papers through the peer review process right now, so we're working on it. Yes. It is generally and openly available. So if you go to hamsideorg slash grape one, you can get the bill of materials. You can um, get all the schematics. Uh, they post, uh, John Gibbons has a link where you can order the board for $8 off of OSH Park, and it's all there. The um, grape uh, two is still being uh, designed. It's getting closer. Those, uh, it will also be open, but it's going to be much more complicated. So you really, it'll be hard for you to build it yourself, but the everything is open about it. I will also note that the uh, hardware canon for the Grape 1 is published in a peer review paper. That's right. And we're also uh, planning on making a, a new version of the grape one, like the grape 1A or something like that, that is going to continue to be available that's supposed to be easier to build than even the current version of the grape one. Because one of the things we want to do is we want to make sure that we have a version of it that really is inexpensive and really can be used for someone who wants to learn how to solder or just learn how a basic receiver works. So something that's a little bit, you know, maybe not as capable, but you can actually, actually learn more from it. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. And would you like the microphone? Thank you. Jay, do you want a minute to work on the live stream? great technical minds at work. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Christina Close enough, thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Kilo Delta 8 Oscar X ray Tango. All right. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see everyone in three dimensions instead of the two to which we've grown accustomed over the past couple of years. Um, very pleased to be giving you our uh, regular check-in on the uh, status of the great hardware, the low-cost personal space weather station side of the project to which Nathaniel was alluding. Um, I want to say a, a quick acknowledgement of all of the members of the great team 
Um, in person, we have here, of course, Nathaniel and the case folks and the uh, Scranton and JIT folks at the back table. Much of what I'm going to show you today is uh, software that was developed by folks on the Thursday telecons. And I would also like to particularly acknowledge John Gibbons and NOBJ, who is the hardware designer for the grape. I'd also like to acknowledge the funding of the National Science Foundation. Uh, so that when they ask me in December, did you acknowledge the funding of the National Science Foundation? I will say yes. So thank them very much as well. Um, I'm going to be pointing to a, a paper that has the grant numbers in that at the end of this. Uh, let's see. Uh, and also, I'd like to um, welcome formally Rachel Bodeker, AC8XY, to the project as the next PhD student. At this point in the, uh, the project, we're coming up on the end of our first three-year uh, grant from the NSF. Our objective for that, if I'm not mistaken, was to have one prototype, and we have approximately 40 deployed stations uh, in multiple countries. So we're doing well. Um, and that finishes up, and then we're going to go into the next phase of the project, as Nathaniel was describing. So what I'm going to show you here is the uh, the system in general, and also uh, some of the visualizations, some examples of uh, data that has been taken with um, with the grapes and information that can be extracted from that data, and give you the resources if you want to make visualizations like that yourself. The key points that I want people to take away from this for anyone who's new to the, uh, to Hamside to Tapper to this project in particular. I know every year for the people who are regulars at this conference, we come up and we show you some of the same pictures, but the, uh, the key points for anybody who's new, I want to emphasize the idea of the ionosphere as a sensor for disturbances from above and below for space weather and for terrestrial weather. And note that you as an amateur radio operator already have more of an intuition for that than you think you do, because you're thinking all the time about how you can make a contact at a new place. The other point that I want to make is that what we're looking at here is the first light of what we've been calling a meta instrument, which is to say one instrument that is made of many distributed sensors. And so we'll have some examples of that. So the other thing that I hope that new viewers watching this will take away is the idea that you might want to consider building your own grape node because all of the resources to do that and all of the information to do that are now readily available. This is a uh, graphical abstract showing the overall grape network. On your left there, you'll see little antennas indicating the volunteer stations collecting data. Not every grape station in the grape network is a grape. Some of them are HF rigs that have GPS DOs and are running the FL Digi software that we use to collect data. If you've worked with us on any of the Eclipse campaigns, uh, you know something about what I'm talking about. The grape version makes a uh, special version of that file, which I'll show you in a bit. This has been gathered up by the uh, folks at the WWV Amateur Radio Club, WW0, WWV. I particularly want to thank uh, Darren Kalmbach and uh, Dave Swartz, um, who have been running that particular effort. We would not be able to do this without them at this stage in the project. Um, and they have been handling the current collection of data from this prototype network uh, on an FTP server. Then I take that data, manually clean it, and I put it up on a repository called Zenodo, um, which is a fair repository, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And so you can access that data. You can also access the visualization code to produce some of the images I'm going to show you. Nathaniel showed this illustration. Uh, we've used it a few times. This is our uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, propagation path illustration. Uh, in it, we pretend that there's only one hop. We pretend that the midpoint is the geographic midpoint. We completely ignore Peterson rays. But uh, the overall concept that the wave fronts get scrunched or stretched as the virtual height of the ionosphere rises or falls is a good way to begin to conceptualize what exactly it is that the grape is observing. And we do have a number of papers and things that go into that in greater detail. But that's the the gist of what our measurement objective is. Here's a, uh, an image from the um, paper on the grape. If you go to doi.org slash, and then you punch in that number at the top there, that will take you to a uh, paper in the Open Access Journal Hardware X, 
which gives all of the information, the build materials, instructions for building your own Grape 1.0. And it will look uh, something like the one on the left, but you will have to add those little labels yourself. Uh, I believe that it was Jim Farmer who added them in this case. And it will, if all is going well, produce a, uh, a file looking something like the one on the right. So, you know, a header and a CSV that gives you three columns, and those columns are your date and time, your, uh, your frequency, and your Doppler shift frequency of the carrier WWV, and your amplitude. And uh, those are at a one second cadence, which is higher than most available instrumentation. I'm going to look at data availability of the current network, both in space and in time. In space, here's our map of stations. What you'll see here is that there's uh, two different types of PIPs apart from the star that represents WWV, WWVH in Hawaii, which is seeing the same tune at the same time, isn't shown in this particular map because we're just looking at the continental United States. We're also not showing our, uh, our friends over in uh, the Netherlands um, who have been running grape nodes over there as well. And we're also not showing CHU, which some people are collecting from. But the, uh, the little round dots represent the stations. And as I showed you in that you know, midpoint model, the geographic midpoint gives you an initial estimate for what exactly is it that you're measuring. Those are marked with the, uh, the diamonds. So you can see that we have kind of this, this cluster of data points going across the United States. And we're looking to fill in more pixels of that map. Visualizing our data availability in time. We're uh, using Gantt chart tools for that. So you can see here the, uh, the data sets that have been collected by various nodes. Um, and the node numbers that have been assigned up to 42. If you would like to get your own node number, check out hamsci.org slash grape1 and talk to John and 8 obj about getting on that list. You don't need to have working hardware to get a node number, but there is an expectation that you will put up working hardware. One of the points to uh, note about this is that this is a very modular system in that it is uh, easy enough to add new um, stations. Stations can switch which frequency they're on and they can, uh, it's tolerant of outages. So it makes it very easy for us to add in new nodes and grow the network organically over time. So the one on the right should look familiar because uh, Nathaniel indicated that in his. This is examples of data that was collected. Both of these were uh, John and 8 obj The one on the left is what one day looks like. You have the Doppler shift on the top and the amplitude on the bottom. And uh, because the um, y-axis is giving you a, a wide range of hertz, it's a little hard to see the sunrise peak in the middle there that's associated with the um, transition from, uh, from night to day. Is that in the middle? Let's see. Should be. Um, and then on the right, this is the long-term variability plot. For those who were at Hamside 2019, you may have seen John show a, a set of plots that look something like these. These are heat maps where you can see on the uh, horizontal axis, you're going from 2020 through to uh, end of May of this year. And the, uh, the top one, the Doppler shift, is mapped in a divergent color map from red to blue, as befits red and blue shift, um, for, uh, for hertz of minus... 0.4 hertz to plus 0.4 hertz, and you can see very, very clearly the changing length of day as those sunrise and sunset lines move. So that lets you uh, see the, the variability and how it changes over the course of a year. And I'm hopeful that as we step deeper into Solar Cycle 25, we'll get some very interesting changes and variability in those plots. On the bottom, we have the same thing for amplitude. Just in case anyone in the room is colorblind, the, uh, the plot on the right is using the um, perceptually uniform Viridis color map um, for the, the same data as the plot on the left. I'll note here that the reason that I like the red-blue is because it conceptually ties in to red and blue shift, and because it's kind of impossible to have a divergent color map that's perceptually uniform, but just in case the other one looked all one color to you, hopefully this one doesn't. The other thing that I'll note here is if you look in the amplitude plot, you can see sort of a vertical line where the amplitude goes up after that vertical line. That was John changing his antenna for a better one. Um, but you'll notice that the Doppler plot doesn't look all that different, so the frequency estimation algorithm seems to be working. 
or at least agreeing with itself across those two points. So that gives you a good sense of what the long-term data from one station looks like and how the, uh, the relatively noisy image of the plot on the left yields something that um, feels much more consistent over time. So where this is really going to shine is when we get into looking at many stations. And I have two examples here. Um, and these are showing, as I said, remember the ionosphere is a sensor for space weather from above, terrestrial weather from below. We have an example on the left of a solar flare, uh, biggest solar flare of um, 2021, October 28th, 2021. There's a, uh, an X-class solar flare, and then there was a C-class solar flare later in the day. And you can see the, um, the Doppler flash in the amplitude plot, and you can see the uh, radio blackout in the received power plot. Uh, many thanks to Nathaniel for making these plots um, very, very nice and uh, modular, and also setting up the color map by um, latitude. Longitude, yes, it, it had to be one of them. Uh, setting up the color map by longitude um, so that you can see very clearly the dependence on solar zenith angle. This is kind of new stuff. I'm not aware of other instruments that can get you this type of information, so we're going to continue to uh, to work on that. And it's one of the areas where having a grape could be a real contributor um, to current science in that area. Then on the right, we have this wonderfully oddball event that uh, the entire geospace community was delighted to capture on January 15th of this year, which was the Tonga eruption. Um, perhaps you saw this one on the news or you saw the LAM wave, the pressure wave that went all the way around the planet and then back some number of times. Uh, this has been consuming scientific meetings about precisely what happened when. And there's some fantastic papers out on the subject and we were able to capture it with our network. So uh, you can see that wave traveling across the, uh, the United States as well through our stations. So finally, if you'd like uh, information on the grape, here's the overall rundown of where it all is. Uh, as Nathaniel said, there's a telecon every week and there's a mailing list specific to that telecon if you'd like to join the network. So the top is uh, that paper I mentioned for how to build your own Grape 1.0 hardware. Uh, there are more models on the way, but this is still a good place to start. It'll be some months before we're able to get other hardware out there. This one's out there now, and it works pretty well. Uh, grape data to date is available on Zenodo, which is a data repository that's managed by CERN um, and is a very good way to put science data out for being able to replicate studies and to have data sets documented in a robust way. Software, as Nathaniel mentioned, is at uh, Hamsai's GitHub page, which has all sorts of delightful little things on it. You should definitely take a look. And if there's something you'd like to add, please file a pull request. We really appreciate uh, being able to do fun open source things. We're very committed to that. And hopefully, this next one is not live yet, but hopefully there will be a preprint out relatively soon. <laughs> Um, that shows all of the plots that I've shown you today and uh, some information about the data set generally that will be kind of our canonical reference point. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much and uh, any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, if you're, if you're running one of these stations and you want to be able to share your data with somebody else, how do you get it from the site referenced? That's what I'm doing. <laughs> so um, if, uh, if you're doing that, so right now we're in the prototype version of the network. One of the things that our next grant uh, has provision to do for the GRIP2 is to uh, put this data up onto Madrigal. Um, which is MIT Haystack system for referencing uh, geospace data. So that system will be very nicely set up for this. Right now what we have is there's the FTP server that has the current data, and then every few months I'm updating that Zenodo page. Um, at present, because of the restrictions of that site, everything's in a giant zip file, which is not wonderful. 
um, but you can pull them off of the FTP server and I'm happy to, to show folks how to do that. You can just punch in a, a URL that's generated as well. Um, and if you have data that you would like to share, one of the things that the Grape 1.0 does is every day it generates you a little plot of what your data did. Um, so you can also get a quick and intuitive sense of, uh, of what's going on there. Bill will be talking later about the next version of this, uh, which will include a waterfall so you can get some live feedback from your station, because part of the goal here is not just to generate data that can be useful in a scientific sense, but also to give ham radio operators a better intuition for their own ionospheric environment. So. What accuracy of timestamp do you need to make this data useful? Uh, well, the GPS DO is very important. Uh, there's some good stuff that, uh, that Steve Sirwin has written up about what happens if you're off by a, uh, a fraction of a hertz in your local oscillator. And that is the, uh, you end up being off by about 80 kilometers in ionospheric height within about four hours. So you want a GPS DO if you're trying to uh, to make really good measurements of this. You can make qualitative measurements. You can go, oh, there was a squiggle at this time. How interesting. And uh, if you look at our paper from the Festival of Frequency Measurement in 2019, you can see a lot of matching squiggles, even from stations that didn't have that. So if you want to get started with it, there's plenty of stuff on the HamSide website about how to just try it out with your own radio, uh, even if you don't have a GPS deal. But, um, and then as far as what the, uh, the cadence is, how many samples you have in the... Um, in the file, uh, we do it at one second cadence, and that's pretty good. The ionosphere does only move so fast. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the, the term that defines that, but maybe Nathaniel can help me out with it. Thank you, that one, yes. <laughs> All right, anything else? Okay. Okay, you next. The antennas vary by station, um, and we do have some uh, initiatives to do some other types of antennas. One of the things we had a senior project student working on was building antennas out of hula hoops. Um, they're actually great. <laughs> you, can, you can make a good mag loop antenna with them. Um, but uh, if you look in the metadata, I think I might actually have this on a slide. Let's see. Ah, yes. Um, in the header... We have antenna 135 foot OCF dipole 30 feet up. This was an older one, so he switched that to a mag loop and that shows up in the metadata. So it varies by station and it's according to whatever antenna you might have available, but that's the, the landscape there. Yes. The open access journal that we publish the hardware in is Hardware X. I'm a big fan of it. I highly recommend it to this crowd. Um, it uh, is a, it's just what it says on the tin. It's a journal for if you have uh, open hardware that you would like to get into a peer reviewed publication that has some use and that you hope will be reused. Their, uh, their slogan is replication is the sincerest form of flattery. They also have some sister journals. They have Software X, which is same thing for software, um, and Methods X same thing for methods, and data in brief, which is one of a few data journals. That's something that's coming up as there's a greater emphasis in the science community on making sure that data is referenceable. So highly recommend that one. So the question was, uh, these are designed for fixed locations. Is there any thought to portable and mobile operation? Uh, we have done a proof of concept um, in, a, uh, in a Pelican case um, for uh, setting up somewhere that gets its location from, uh, from its GPS instead of you punching the location in. So not for the Grape 1.0, but at least for something that you could like tote to a location and set up. There, there's been some effort in that direction. And I believe that when we get to, uh, to Grape 2.0, it will be pulling that information from GPS uh, in order to avoid the human in the loop in that part of it. 
um, so that people don't drop it a decimal place or something like that. Um, yeah. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much. Check, check. Check, check. Okay. Thank you very much, Christina. So 